If you've never met uh, Maurice Lee, uh, you might just say, read his, uh, his Vita and say, this guy, he's, he's amazing. And he is. Uh, he started off majoring in math at Wheaton College. Now, anyone who majors in math already has my respect and awe because I'm no good at math. But then I can always console myself and say, but I'm good with words and I'm good with ideas and I have kind of a right brain, you know, kind of thing. But then he went on from Wheaton to uh, get a degree from Caltech in computation and neural systems. From there, he did theology at Fuller and at Yale and uh, has done postdoctoral research in theology and evolution at Harvard. Uh, he likes to dabble in conversations between Christian theology and natural sciences uh, and explore medieval and contemporary theologies of the Holy Spirit. Man. But you know, if you know Maurice Lee, you know a man who is uh, known chiefly by his warmth and his, his hospitality. He and Beth, their daughter Ravinia, are among the most hospitable and genuinely open-hearted Christians I've ever met. Uh, but what a fertile mind, what a, what a wonderful gift this man is to this college. And uh, Maurice, I hope I didn't embarrass you with all the stuff I already said, but I just, I just like you a lot, and uh, I'm grateful uh, to be among those you count as a friend, and, uh, and I'm eager to receive what God has given you to share with us today in chapel. Come on up. Raise this again. Hey. They will. Well, I can't really see you, but I'm trusting that there's a good crowd here today. I saw you before, so I think there are several hundred probably. Not quite the 70,000 that were in the stadium in Indianapolis yesterday. But still a good crowd, and Santa Barbara is warmer than Indianapolis at this point. So I want to think about being part of a crowd. We're here together. We've gathered this morning to, uh, to, to be here in chapel. And it can be fun, can't it, to be part of a crowd. No one says, well, I went to this great party last night. There were only two people there. It's great to be in a crowd, to be with others. But crowds can have a dark side too, can't they? They can be dangerous. A crowd can turn into a mob, a destructive and violent killing mob. Even when you don't get killing, you can have rioting or a stampede. And even when a crowd does not become lethally dangerous or violent, you can still feel lost in a crowd. You can become just a number, a faceless atom, absorbed into the mass like a drop is absorbed into the ocean. It can become easy in a crowd to lose any sense of, of purpose beyond that of simply your individual being. So I want to reflect this morning on the fact that we here gathered together at, as Westmont College. We don't call ourselves just a crowd. We don't come together on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 1030 and just say, well, that's a great crowd that we have here. Instead, we call ourselves a community. And not just any kind of community, but a Christian community. I want to ask, what does that mean? What does it look like to be a Christian community? If we call ourselves not just a crowd, but a Christian community, what kind of community is that? What kind of community should it be? What kind of community are we supposed to be as Westmont College? I hope you recognize that this isn't a theoretical, simply abstract question. It makes a difference. It makes a difference 
what kind of community we are. You know, if we're just a crowd, if we gather here just as a bunch of people who happen to be in the same place at the same time, then it makes perfect sense for us simply to look out for, to be concerned for our own private, individual interest and benefit. Right? You don't want to be lost in the crowd, so you'll just do your own thing. If we're a crowd, if we're just a bunch of people in the same place at the same time here in chapel, then it makes perfect sense if the lights are up, to text your friends, or to do your homework, or to do whatever it is that interests you instead of being concerned about something that may be larger. If being at Westmont College is just being part of a crowd, just being part of a bunch of people who are, just happen to be at this place in Santa Barbara for these years, then it makes perfect sense to just be concerned about your own interests, your own career. It makes perfect sense to be concerned about others or about the resources that are available here only insofar as they benefit yourself, myself. So we have to ask the question, what if worship, what if our time in chapel is more than just a kind of crowd event? What if chapel and the worship that takes place in chapel is more than just what I get out of it? What if that's the wrong question to ask? What did I get out of it? What if community, the kind of community that we say that Westmont College is, is more than just using other people and the resources that are here to take advantage of so that I can advance my own agenda, my own benefit, my own interest, my own career? That's the question I want to ask today. What does it mean for us to be? A community. A few years after I graduated from college, um, some time ago now, I read the uh, now famous book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Some of you may have read that before. Now, I've got to admit, I've never found self-help books very helpful. And to tell the truth, this, wasn't, this one wasn't very helpful either. But, but it's also true. I don't want, I don't want to spend my time uh, criticizing it. It's also true that I've never forgotten, even though I've forgotten everything else about the book and it, wasn't, it didn't end up being very helpful as a self-help book, I've never forgotten one of the principles, one of the, what Stephen Covey calls habits, that he says are characteristic of highly effective people. Here's the principle or the habit that he talks about. If you know the book, you know it's number two. Begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. In other words, let what you do, whatever, is it, whatever it is that you're doing, be informed, be shaped by a vision of what the final result should be. It's the destination not the immediate circumstances, not the kind of default little decisions that we make, but it's the destination that determines the shape of the journey, what steps that we take where we put our energy. And I think this resonates well. I think it resonates really well with a biblical and Christian way of thinking and living. So I want to meditate with you for a few minutes on what community looks like, what Christian community looks like from a perspective at the end, the goal, the destination. What is the goal of Christian community? And to do that, I want to, since we've already spent some time in it, this morning I want to continue with you in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Now, First, let me say a, for a few words about why the book of Revelation. Revelation may be the most abused and or unknown book in the Bible. 
we tend to do one or both of two things with it. Either we almost completely ignore it. After all, it's full of these strange images and symbols and codes and difficult, uh, and difficult ideas and what have you. So we ignore it. It becomes part of that elite class of Bible books like 3 John and Obadiah that we know absolutely nothing about. <laughs> Either that or we try to use it as a kind of crystal ball to see the future. We try to figure out what the particular events are and what sequence they'll occur in at the end of time. Does the tribulation happen before the rapture or after the rapture or in the middle of the millennium or is the millennium, is it a thousand years or what have you? What signs will be given when the end of time has come. So the book of Revelation often either drops out of our Bible effectively or it becomes a kind of coded message that only those who are in that time, right, the 21st century now, we know that the end of the world is coming because all these things are happening. They, they, the, uh, they, uh, the signs line up. Israel has become a state. Um, in, the, in the 70s, it was that, that uh, the, the nation of China had, uh, had a 200 million person army. Um, the uh, Soviet Union was, uh, was lining up to, uh, to, to engage in the final uh, battle of Armageddon and so forth. So it becomes a coded message that only we in the 20th or 21st centuries can understand. But Revelation is not, it's not a, it's not an, it's like, it's not like an appendix that you can take out when it becomes inflamed and, and, you, yeah, and you can just carry on with life as usual. And it's not a crystal ball. It's not a timeline. It's not some sort of chronology of events that will take place in the near future. Un instead, revelation is just that. It's a revelation. It's a revealing. It's an unveiling. True, it's an unveiling in symbols and in language that, that, that captivates the imagination, but it's a, it's a revelation, an unveiling of God's ultimate purposes for his creation. Revelation peels back the surface layer of the politics and the military strategies and the economics and the decisions made by the movers and shakers that we think are so important, that we think are guiding the world where it is going and instead shows us beneath the surface the reality, the reality of the true conflict between good and evil, the reality of God's sovereignty and the reality of God's intention for the world that he has created. So I want to spend some time with you just a few minutes in a particular part of this often misunderstood book of the Bible, Revelation, and I want to ask, what does this tell us from the perspective of the goal, from the perspective of the fulfillment of God's intentions, what does this tell us about Christian community? Here's what Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 say. This is John, he's as uh, the, the seer, the, the visionary is reporting on the things that he sees and in the middle of reporting on the opening of, of seals, uh, of a scroll, um, he suddenly sees a lot of people, a crowd. I saw a vast crowd, he says, a multitude in some other translations, too great to count. From every nation and tribe and people and language, we've heard that already today, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. So John is, in the spirit of God, he's been brought up into the, the reality, the, the deep reality that underlies the surface layer of what we see and hear and smell and so forth. He's being given a vision, a revelation into what's really there. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands and they were shouting with a great roar. Another translation is crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs or comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. 
What a vision. And, and talk about a crowd. It's often difficult to figure out how many people are in a particular place at a particular time when there's a, when there's a large number. Sometimes that has political ramifications. If you are organizing a political rally and you say, well, we had, we had 500,000 people and other people are saying, well, no, our estimates came to 50,000 50, or 5,000, you can have some debates over how effective the rally was. But here, you know, all of those estimates and all of those attempts have gone out the window. He's just given up. No one can number this crowd. It's a multitude beyond counting. I want to bring your attention to one particular phrase, one particular way that John describes this community, this reality. He says that the crowd too great to count is from every nation and tribe and people and language. What kind of an observation is this? Is it just random? Is it like saying, well, I saw this huge crowd and a lot of them were wearing red hats? What John is trying to say here is that there is a, the, 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 the crowd here, the multitude in this vision of his represents the fulfillment of God's promise and covenant with his people. He's making, a, he's making an allusion here in Revelation chapter 7 to a whole raft of biblical passages and texts from the Old Testament. By the way, this is the only way really to understand the book of Revelation, to, to recognize that it quotes the Old Testament con con continuously, almost continuously. You can't, you can't go more than a few verses in the book of Revelation without realizing that the Old Testament is being alluded to, referenced, or somehow evoked. Remember Genesis chapter 12, God promising Abraham that all peoples, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Later in Genesis in chapter 22, he says to Abraham, in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. It's not just in Genesis, in Isaiah, the servant of the Lord who is raised from the, from the, from the stock of Israel, from the people of Israel, is promised by God to be made a covenant for the people and a light for the nations. That is the purpose for which Israel has been chosen. I will make you, God says to his servant, a light to the Gentiles, a light to the nations, a light to the peoples, and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. In Daniel 7, we have a vision of, a, of one who is given authority by God. One like a son of man. And to him was given dominion, Daniel says, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. What do we have here in Revelation chapter 7? We have a picture that completes the story of God's ways with Israel that came to their climax in the Son of Man Jesus Christ. To be part of this community, to be part of this numberless crowd who are giving praise to God and to the Lamb is to be part of the great story that God is telling and living with his people. A story that has Israel as its center, at its center and Jesus, the Israelite, at its climax. To be part of this community, to be part of a community that, that takes its character, that takes its nature, that takes what it's like from this end, from this goal, is to be part of the story, is to be immersed in the narrative, the drama of God's ways with Israel and Jesus. I want you to notice one thing about the way that John talks about this crowd, this community. He says it's from every nation and from every tribe and every people and every language. 
Note that the differences between nations and tribes and peoples and languages are not erased. In fact, that's what gives this picture such amazing depth and drama. It's true, they're saying the same thing. Salvation comes from, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They're a community after all. They're not a random crowd. They're not just off pursuing their own individual benefit. But they're saying the same thing all from their different backgrounds and identities. A doctor from Nairobi says that salvation comes from our God and from the Lamb. Says it differently. It's the same thing, but he says it differently than a steel worker from Tulsa. A Japanese 13-year-old says that salvation comes from God and from the Lamb differently, from a different background, from a different identity, from a different culture, from a different life history than a Venezuelan 80-year-old. What's striking about this community that is described in Revelation chapter 7, this community that where of, of God's gathering of his people, what's striking about this community is its diversity. What we have here is a panorama of difference. And that panorama, imagine a picture in which you can identify, you can pick out people. It's a, it's a, huge, it's a huge crowd. It's a, um, you know, one of those, those poster-sized pictures. Huge crowd, but you can, you can not only pick out individual faces and see them, but somehow dig down into who they are. Dig down into their histories, their culture, their background, where they came from, what their interests are, and so forth. And that panorama, that picture, is what glorifies God. It's what glorifies God in his intention to bring together a community, to bring together a people from the whole range of human nations, the whole range of human tribes, the whole range of human cultures and languages. Ask yes, the question again, what kind of community are we at Westmont? If we're not just a crowd, if we're not just a bunch of random individuals who just happen to be in the same place at the same time, what kind of a community do we have? How can we reflect our identity as a Christian community and not just a crowd? If we take this vision seriously, if we begin with the end in mind, if we read Revelation 7 and see beneath the surface of the events that seem to, that seem superficially to shape our lives and see instead the deep reality of God's intention for us together. If we take this vision seriously, then we'll begin to suspect we will begin to suspect that God is gathering people for the praise of his glory through Jesus from the whole kaleidoscopic variety of backgrounds and cultures and ethnicities. We will begin to suspect as we live out our life as a Christian community that we have an opportunity. We have a great opportunity. We have multiple opportunities to reflect and to celebrate and to anticipate that goal, that destination, that place where all of God's ways and works are ending up by valuing and pursuing diversity in our life as a community. If we take this vision seriously, we'll begin to suspect that Christian community is not just a set of resources that I can exploit, draw on to advance my own grade or my own career or my own benefit, but instead it's something else. It's got a larger and bigger and higher purpose. That somehow, even now, our Christian communities are singing together praise to God and to the Lamb because of his salvation. If we take this vision seriously, we will begin to suspect that we 
have the calling, we have the privilege of loving each other, of practicing love, not in spite of our differences, not uh, marginalizing our differences, not ignoring our diversity, but precisely because we are different from each other. And we have the opportunity and the privilege and the calling to expand our circle of love, to expand our circle of community so that we can increase the way that we reflect God's purposes for his people. If we take this vision seriously, if we think seriously from the perspective of the end about what Christian community is, what it could be like, what it's supposed to be reflecting, then we will realize that we're not just a crowd, not just a random collection of people, but we are meant to be in our lives somehow showing forth the diversity, the multiplicity, the, 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 the variety of God's wisdom in our lives so that we now and forever may stand before the throne and before the Lamb, crying out together, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Thanks be to God.